Okay, welcome back to classes, uh, my wonderful students. What just happened? All right, there we go. Um, I'd like to um, instruct you uh, concerning the final exam. For us, it's going to be in this room at 1 o'clock on Saturday, December 10th. It is obligatory. Nobody gets to skip it except uh, SSG leaders if they do everything they're supposed to do. Uh, they're excused from it, but uh, this is not a dropped exam. And so you've got to be there. So everybody is going to have to be there. Um, if you work off campus on Saturdays, talk to your BOSS right now and get Saturday afternoon off till about four. All right. And that's under the, if you know, so from lunch till about four and under the theory that you're going to need all two hours and 50 minutes um, 170 minutes total for the exam. Now, you may finish earlier than uh, that. You may finish at 3 o'clock. Uh, but if you don't, you're ready. If, if you tell your boss, okay, I need to be up on campus till about 4, okay? And I'm not going to budge. Academics as first priority. You get your job squared away. Um, that's your responsibility, okay? Um we're going to hand out the exam printouts uh, as soon as Miss Darian gets over here. Uh, she's picking them up right now. They just got finished. Um, and I don't even know what the average is on the exam. You know, we just got the data for it. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't turn in the exams on, on uh, Friday like I normally do uh, because UCF was shut down. Boy, UCF. I guess most of you guys were not around because UCF was like a ghost town on Friday. I came up here, I had to do some work on the exam stuff, and man, there it was, I, I'll put it this way, I got my favorite parking spot without any fuss or muss. And if you know parking spots here at UCF, you know that it's pretty tough to get a good one. But Friday it wasn't even a problem. Um, I have some comments about reading ahead, and then we're going to talk about uh, de Broglie's uh, wave theory of the electron. Uh, before we do that, let me just give you a couple um, comments about exam three. Um, the Scantron printouts are based on 40 points. That's how many dots we have. All right. And so what, the, and these are SSG selfies. I always get a kick out of these things. I, I won't get them. There's no, you know, you SSG leaders, there's, it's, it's no function other than, you know, joyfulness, that's all. Anyway, uh, the raw score on your printout when you get it in a few minutes uh, is accurate, but as before, the percentage is not. So don't go by the percentage that they print. Because they don't know Jack over there about um, the other 10 points in the clicking. All right, and oh, was that you over here on that picture? Yeah, okay, good, because that's a memorable picture. All right, now the blurb files are going to be posted in uh, maybe tonight. And, uh, and then the clicking data I'm still working on. I am definitely not happy about the clicking data. I mean, you guys are doing all right. I, I, I looked at, you know, there's a lot of people who got correct answers and stuff. But the way I had to do it was a pain in the neck. So it might take a couple days to get that all squared away. Uh, now, um, I want to talk about bonus points. I got a, a message in web courses uh, yesterday, I guess, or I answered it yesterday. Oh, Dr. B, if I didn't make it to the exam, do I lose my SSG bonus points? And the answer to that is no. The, the, 
Bonus points are a lot like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. You know, you take the ingredients, peanut butter, jelly, and bread, and in the initial state, they're separate. And then you put them together, they're adjacent to each other. You know, you got a layer of peanut butter, a layer of bread, a layer of jam, and then a layer of bread. You know, so there's a lot of adjacency. And, uh, but then in the final state, after you consume it, it all gets smushed together in your stomach. And so the same thing with bonus points of any kind, SSG or any other bonus points. Uh, they're in the grade book, and they're not going anywhere. Now, it, the other thing is, if you got bonus points for special study group three, or to prepare for exam three, and then it turns out that uh, your exam three is the one that we drop, uh, and I'll be doing that this week, too. I'll be figuring out your best two out of three midterms for the majority of you. Uh, if this is the one, if you got special study group bonus points, and then we drop exam three, you don't lose those bonus points. They're, they're there, so don't worry about that. Okay, they're not going anywhere. And uh, so it's, so there's a close-up of that, one of the SSGs. And, you know, usually, I, I love seeing these pictures. Everybody's smiling, except I'm not really sure about this guy. Uh, he looks a, like he drank a little bit too much coffee. I'm not sure, but uh, it was, I, got, I got a kick out of that. That was kind of funny looking. Uh, anyways, I'm, I'm glad you're you know, being a good sport about it. Uh, anyways, here's where we're headed. Let's, let's keep going. And, we'll, and as soon as Darian gets over here, we'll break and do the exams that, or the printouts and then, and then come back to regular lecture. Uh, December 1st is the last regular class meeting, and that's a Thursday. And then, and then after that, we have, exam, we have study day and then exam week. Okay, now today we're going to wrap up Chapter 9 topics uh, about the electron, wave theory of the electron, and de Broglie's hypothesis and stuff. And I think uh, eventually we're going to, maybe tomorrow, we're going to tackle this diagram here. Um, and then we're going to move onward to the periodic table, which is chapter 10. So maybe a lecture or two about that. And then finally, a lecture or so about compounds in chapter 11. And remember, the periodic table is the top of the mountain. And once you're at the top of the mountain, uh, you sit down and look around. And when we look around, we're going to be looking at compounds. You know, we're not looking at another mountain range. We're going to look at compounds. For instance, uh, good old H2O. Uh, another common one, NaCl, salt, sodium chloride. Uh, calcium carbonate, CaCO3. Here's a little diagram of it. Uh, calcium carbonate, uh, which forms the, the bulk of most limestone, and limestone being the bedrock of almost all of the Florida Peninsula. So when you burrow down through the ground, through all the soil, and you get to bedrock, it's, it's uh, mostly limestone. Retinal, which is the molecule, it's, uh, I believe it's a protein molecule, they consider it a protein, in the retina of your eye. And this is the one that is toggled back and forth by visible photons in the Roy G. Biv uh, frequency range. And uh, it's a, a very important molecule, DNA. And here's a picture of one of the most famous images of DNA. We're going to talk about that as well. Uh, this is the image that in back in the 1950s, uh, this is actually an X-ray diffraction image of DNA, and this is the one that clued them in. Whoa, look at that. DNA, double helix, double spiral structure. This is the image that did it. So we're going to talk a little bit about DNA, maybe a few other molecules in there. I mean, it's to talk about a lot of molecules, you want to take a chemistry course, unfortunately. But uh, we're going to talk about those. Now, uh, as a reminder, uh, we do have some more homework coming up. And we do have more clicking. 
By the way, when I uh, do your best two out of three, I'm going to add a new row to in the, in the examinations part of your grades page. And it's going to be entitled best two out of three. And for most of you, like 80-something percent of you, um, there's going to be uh, a best two out of three. Some of you only have two. In that case, your only two grades are your best two, okay? Uh, and I don't think anybody's missed more than, than one, uh, one exam. So anyways, most of you, it's going to be best two out of three. And at that point, I'll try to make um, a clicking roundup, okay? And then a, a homework roundup and give you one more estimate of your grade. Maybe this, maybe I'll get to it this weekend. It's a lot of work, especially for a big group like this. And I got all the clicking data that I've got to unravel as well. So, uh, but hopefully I'll be getting to that this week or maybe next week. Okay, that's coming up. And that will give you an eyeball and an estimate on your grade state. Uh, going into pretty much going into the final, all right, based on 150 points possible, two midterms, 25 points from HW, 25 more points from uh, clicking, and a total of 150. And then after the final, it'll go on the basis of 250 points, except for the SSG leaders. Those guys will be graded on. I'm going to have to revise my. Uh, method for SSG leaders. They're getting away with uh, a lot here this semester. Skipping exams and the final two. I don't know. What do you think, George? Yeah. Anyways, I don't, I don't hear any, any of those guys complaining. But uh, anyways, there's more coming up. And so hopefully uh, you'll have uh, one more estimate before we go into the final. There's going to be traditionally a big mega review homework uh, that I will convert to bonus points, and that'll be after the December 1st lecture, the last lecture of the semester. In addition, sometimes I have a little uh, uh, mega review in class. Depends on um, what I want to do. Uh, we might have a, a clicker mega review in class uh, to help you study for the final. Um, anyways, the homework will definitely will have that. That'll be in web courses, and it'll be due on Saturday, December 10th. So think of it as a study tool, and I'll convert, you know, it might have 30 questions or 30 points, and I'll convert it to two or three bonus points, depending on, you know, how many you get right. And I'll give you several, uh, like maybe six attempts, so you can use it as a study tool and talk with your study group about it and so forth. And then um, it has to be due on Saturday, December 10th. So I might make it 9 a.m. on Saturday. Um, and that's typically what I do. Now, the reason that I do that, the, the mega review homework, is so that everybody can get a little bit of bonus point um, activity this semester. And if you didn't get, you know, like a lot of you guys, you didn't get your clicker squared away because you didn't get early iClicker registration bonus because your financial aid didn't come in. Okay. Uh, you didn't get to an SSG. Okay. Because you didn't, you know, didn't have time. You couldn't fit in your schedule for whatever reason. Okay. Uh, but everybody will be able to hack into this and, and uh, blaze through this uh, mega review homework. And if you do, you might get two or three bonus points. And that'll cover up a little bit of smelliness in your iClicker participation. You know, say you missed a, a little bit more. Say you came late to class a little bit, or you, or you missed a few lectures, a little bit more than one or two lectures. Um, or your homework, you blew a couple of the big homeworks, and so you're looking at 22 instead of 25 out of 25 you know, the, the bonus point activity. And this is stuff that everybody will be able to, to get. So, um, unfortunately, you know, some of the bonus point activity, not, not everybody can participate with, uh, but this one you will be. Okay, questions about any of this stuff?
Yes, Carl. Thank you for asking that. Carl asks, uh, for SSG, do we have to choose again and stuff like that? The answer to that is yes. The way that the second round of SSG goes, uh, you might want to make a note of it. The special study group leaders will figure out a new time, new place, new day for their special study group. And, it can, and you SSG leaders, it can be completely different. If you didn't like where you were in the library or all night study or wherever it might have been, you can choose a different place. In addition, uh, you guys will sign up for special study groups again. So you can, you, you know, you can choose a different leader. You know, it's all a, a whole new go round. And so uh, if you were with George uh, Dutcher for this round, uh, you might be with Samantha Sabalos uh, for the second round, right? And more power to you. Except make sure you don't drink too much coffee. And you're all right after that. But, but anyway, so it'll go, Carl, does that answer your question? It'll, you know, everybody gets a second, you know, so you're not, in other words, oh, by the way, I had a student ask me, oh, Dr. B, are they, are, are, is our special study group going to meet again on Tuesday? Um, how do I, and the answer to that is no. Special study group is one time. And then again, one time during finals week. So there's only two sessions. You sign up for one and that's the one you go to. And you sign up again, and then that's the one you go to. It's not an every week thing. Unless you make a friend. I mean, if you make a friend in special study group or, or make a friend, Michael, in um, SI, uh, you know, then you study with them whenever you feel like it, which is good. You know, studying with another human being, Brock, is always preferable than studying by yourself, my opinion. It helps you make connections, helps you talk things over, just like office hours on Wednesday. By the way, Wednesday, uh, we're going to have just right, I'm going to have office office hours. And what that means is I'm going to meet with students um, individually in my office for private discussion uh, and usually about grades and stuff. So if you want to uh, talk about grades uh Tomorrow, Wednesday, it's, you know, we'll just wait outside my door and I'll call you in. Okay, it should be good. Right. Now, uh, I'm still waiting for Miss Darian. She's not here yet. I hope she hasn't been kidnapped by space aliens or something like that. Those guys in the computer center where they grade the tests... It's kind of like that guy, that red stapler guy in office space. Raise your hand if you ever saw office space. Yeah, you know the red stapler guy. All right, now let's get back to business, the quantum physics of the hydrogen atom. Uh, we talked about quantum leaps last time. Uh, we'll review that but uh, in, in a minute. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to do a clicker question. So take your clicker out, turn it on. And let's try a question here to start. Um, the Balmer series. Quantum, what kind of quantum leaps for the Balmer series? Go ahead and answer that. Fifteen seconds to vote. I'm going to ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh, 
Malik, do you have Darian's uh, email? Can, can you email him quick? See if she's all right? I'd like to, but you can do it. That'll be helpful. Uh, all right. Answer, n equals 2. Um, now, I'll go ahead and make a note of this. Balmer series is the set of spectral lines for photons um, generated by electrons jumping down to n equals 2. So n equals 3 to n equals 2. n equals 4 down to n equals 2. n equals 5 down to n equals 2. The reason for that, the n equals 2 transition, or excuse me, the n equals 2 energy level is going to be the preferred energy level for hydrogen at a certain temperature. Let me repeat that. N equals 2 is the preferred landing and stable orbit at a certain temperature for the hydrogen. Okay? If it's really cold hydrogen, then N equals 1, the ground state, would be the preferred landing spot. It would land and tend to stick there, all right? And so you can excite something upward from N equals 1, but at a certain temperature, it's going to eventually dip back down to N equals 1. At a slightly higher temperature, it won't be able to stay at N equals 1, it'll, it'll, but it'll, it'll be happy at N equals 2, all right? And a slightly higher temperature above that, it'll prefer N equals 3 as the, the landing point. Now, each of those land preferred temperatures, preferred landing levels, uh, correspond to different series. Okay? N equals 2 preferred landing spot at a certain temperature is the Balm, gives you the Balmer series. The N equals 1 is called the Lyman series, L-Y, and you can read about it in chapter 9. Uh, the Lyman series, the photons are generated by electrons that jump down to N equals 1. You know, and then and these tend to be a lot of ultraviolet photons, higher energy. N equals 3 is the Passion series, P-A-S-C-H-E-N. Right, it's a different series, and these ones tend to be infrared. So Balmer tends to be visible, the stuff landing at n equals 3. The stuff landing at n equals 1 tends to be a lot of ultraviolet, the uh, Lyman series. And the infrared passion series is the one that at an even higher temperature. And there's you know very serious for hydrogen that you can go to. So this whole idea of being in equilibrium with a, a you know, the, the atoms being in, in thermal equilibrium at a certain temperature uh, is important for understanding these series. Last time we talked about this, that um, the basic idea is that certain orbits and no others, a countable set, are permitted. The electron drops from a higher orbit to a lower orbit and emits a photon. A fo an incoming photon of a very precise color will boost an electron to a higher orbit. Only certain photons of certain colors will give that electron enough energy to get to the next orbit up. Now we didn't initially they didn't really know. Uh, why these num why only certain orbits were allowed? I mean, they knew that it was countable, and they knew that because basically they knew this. I mean, they they knew you know Balmer series. He figured that out, and they knew that there were discrete spectral lines, H alpha, H beta, H gamma, H delta, and on down, um, and that they were countable and not continuous. And so they knew that there was some, but they, they, you know, you know, why is nature restricting the orbits? Why isn't it like the moon and the earth? You know, any gravitational distance, you know, is permitted, theoretically, uh, but not for atoms. Another thing is um, 
the, uh, the whole idea of photon energy. You know, Bohr and Einstein, I, I mentioned, they used this formula, e equals HF. And H is Planck's constant. So the, the idea was, all right, you can measure the wavelength lambda in the lab. That's not too difficult. And if, if we had labs for this class, uh, you guys would be able to do it. It's, it's it, matter of fact, you can use a laser, a red helium neon laser, and a little stack of staples, you know, from the box of, you know, you, you buy a box of staples to load into your stapler, and they, they come out, and, you know, you get a, a big block of like about 150 staples kind of glued together, and they're regular spacing, and you can even use that for uh, generating a diffraction pattern from which you calculate the wavelength. And then you calculate the frequency using C equals lambda F. And um, as I mentioned here in, in the notes, Balmer and, and all those guys in his day, in the 18, late 1800s, they were able to do all that. They just didn't know why. And then uh, Bohr and Einstein said, look, let's, let's think of those specific lines um, as corresponding to a certain amount of energy. Did she reply yet? Malik, did you mail it? Not yet. I hope she's all right. I'm thinking what could have what could have happened to Miss Darian. She'll be coming here in a minute. It'll be fine. Uh, anyway, so uh, their theory was, all right, those, those energies, the photon energies, if we use Planck's formula and we apply it to photons, uh, then it, it'll tell us the energy levels of the atom. And we already know that the atoms are uh, governed by the Coulomb interaction. We know the approximate size of the atoms. So we can figure out a lot about the atom by looking at those wavelengths. You know, get the wavelengths, get the frequency, get the energy, it's Coulomb, figure out the electrical potential energy, bing, bang, bow, we get a lot of information. Now, Planck's constant, let's talk about that for a minute. One constant to rule them all, as I've said before. Question? What'd she say? Oh. Okay, tell, tell her it's okay, we'll do it on Thursday. Okay, so change of plan. No printouts today. Okay, that's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll give you guys your printouts on Thursday. Anyways, let's keep going with Planck's constant. It turns out that Pl Planck, uh, Max Planck, this guy with the mustache, uh, came up with this constant. Here it is. Go ahead and write this number down. It's, it's, com it's amazingly small, 10 to the minus 34 Joule seconds. Remember, that's, uh, that's the units of action or angular momentum. And so we say that H is the quantum of action, or the you could call it the quantum of angular momentum if you like. And I'm going to give you a little blurb about uh, why um, or how he developed it and, uh, in just a minute. But um, Planck's constant is a constant that applies to every single thing in the universe, including your left nostril, your right big toe, and every other part of you. Now, you may not realize that, but it does. Every galaxy in the universe, every star, every planet, every photon of light is governed by Planck's constant, one constant to rule them all. Now, let's go and look at this. Here's the hydrogen atom, the basic structure. Um, here's our central question. Um, how is it that nature selects just this specific set of orbits? Okay, the N equals, and you know, we can figure out the delta EPE, you know, for each orbit by looking at the, the wavelengths. 
Uh, so we can figure out the, the rough dimensions of each orbit, you know, by figuring out, you know, kq1, q2 over r squared. You know, we can handle that. Um, but why is it, you know, it, it's almost like there's some kind of granularity, you know, or pixelation. It's almost like a, a pixelation of the, a dynamical pixelation of the universe. You know, we look at images and... Um, Every image on this screen that you're looking at, every image on your cell phone, is a set of pixels that um, are, you know, arranged to make it look like a face or, you know, a guy on a bicycle or, what, you know, whatever it happens to be. And so, <coughs> excuse me, our question is why? You know, the guy that figured this out is named Louis de Broglie, a French guy. And he's like a count or a prince. He's a prince, or he was a prince. He's, he died a number of years ago. Um, and back in 19, I don't know, 25, I think, he came with uh, the hypothesis. It's pretty simple, all right? Electrons are the things orbiting the nucleus. Hydrogen's proton. Uh, what if we treat an electron as a wave? You know, now J.J. Thompson figured out that it's a small particle. You know, it has a certain mass, charge to mass ratio, and he figured out it's really small. And then Rutherford figured out, okay, the nucleus is really small and it's positive. And so we thought of those as particles, but Louis de Broglie said, no, think of it as a wave, and then all this stuff makes sense, the countable orbits that exclude all other orbits. And here's what he said. Consider the electron to be a wave, all right? And it's curving around the nucleus. So at the center of this diagram is a nucleus, which is not in the diagram, okay? And this is just showing the, the different waves. And it has to have a certain wavelength in order to exactly come back to itself and constructively interfere and basically form a standing wave, all right? So, so de Broglie said, all right, stop thinking about an electron as a particle, a little tiny baseball that has electric charge. Think of it as a wave. And you know, when we were here in lecture, we had the, the coil spring and we had the guitar and we know that if, if you have a certain tension on a string of a certain length and a certain mass per unit length, then you're gonna get a certain tone. Certain tone means a certain frequency. Certain frequency means a certain wavelength. So a guitar string and that slinky that we had up here, certain frequencies and no others, okay? Guitar strings, certain wavelengths, and no others. And even if it's out of tune, I mean, you know, we, we want to have a guitar that's tuned, but if, if, it, if you change the, the um, you know, the tension in the string, for instance, you'll get a wave and only that wave, but it'll, it'll sound sour to your ear, but it, it'll still be a certain size wave. Uh, so that's what de Broglie said. Now... Here's how he connected this to Planck's constant. He said, use Planck's constant in this formula to generate the wavelength. And the wavelength is uh, lambda equals h, Planck's constant, divided by mv. Now, on Thursday, I'll probably go through a calculation with you uh, on using that. And so, de Broglie said, if, if you do this, you, you are basically allowing the dynamics, so Planck's constant and the Coulomb interaction, to control the size of the wavelength. Because you will only want certain wavelengths that make it exactly one trip around, you know, one wiggle for one circumference. I mean, if you look at this one, 
here's this this lower one here actually has this is not the ground state this is n equals two this one has two wiggles uh, uh, yeah so this is the first excited state it has two wiggles uh, in one circumference now this second circle out look at this look at this diagram and you can see all kinds of diagrams the the I, I hate to tell you that the diagrams in the book are not very good. This is a chapter, chapter nine, that I did not write. Uh, I borrowed it from another. But this diagram is pretty good. Look, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is um, three full oscillations, a bump and a dip, a bump followed by a dip, followed by a bump, followed by a dip, followed by a bump right there, followed by a dip, and then coming back to the first bump. Okay, so that's the n equals three state. And then this one is, let's see, one, two, three, well, you can't see. It's gotta be the n equals four state. Um, let me go back a little bit here. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, let's count these. One, we'll start up here. No, we'll start, we'll start over here at, 11 o'clock, bump, dip, bump, second dip, bump, third dip. Wait a minute, did I count that right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Wait a minute, this is no good. Oh, this one is, is it seven? No, this is one, this is all one. Right over here. Hmm, I never realized this picture is defective. This should have eight, eight lobes, and it only has six. Hmm, I'll have to make my own diagram for this. Anyways, the principle is a destructive, inter or excuse me, constructive interference at the right wavelength, destructive everywhere else. Now, let's take a look at Planck's constant. How did he figure out his quantum of action? As I mentioned last Tuesday, and I'll mention again today, he was trying to figure out thermal physics. And one of the things that they had been trying to figure out in the late 1800s, you know, everybody knows that, you know, like the burner on your stove, on your electric stove, it'll turn red when it gets really hot. And if it's not really hot, it'll be less red and if it's really, really hot, it'll be white hot. And so the color and the amount of energy that comes off a thermal object or an incandescent object uh, is controlled by the temperature. And uh, so he was trying to figure that out. Nobody could figure it out, you know, how the, the distribution of energies work. So he made this assumption, okay, all those little atoms in the thermal object, the incandescent object that's producing light because it is so HOT, all those little atoms and molecules are, are uh, oscillating around like little teeny uh, spring oscillators. Therefore, they have a frequency. Okay, they're, they're, you know, they're rattling back and forth, you know, and they have a certain frequency. And he said, all right, if... If I make the energy of a single oscillator to be proportional to the frequency, then all my fancy count, you know, I'm, I'm skirting over a bunch of fancy stats and calculus here, but he was trying to, you know, fit the data. He was trying to figure out a big fancy calculus theory and the middle of his calculus theory that fit all the data, and only he was able to do it, he was the first guy to fit the data, um, was this very simple relation. The energy of each of those little oscillating molecules was proportional to frequency. Okay, so the energy is in joules. Uh, the, and his constant, which he was able to calculate, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. And that's the same as kilogram meter squared per second. That's the quantum of action, or as, as some people refer to it, the quantum of angular momentum. And that is the 
And that is for thermal physics. Thermal physics is pretty mysterious, just like this picture of Planck. He was an interesting guy. He lived all the way through World War II, and uh, he, he never became a Nazi. And he was kind of old by those days in, in the time of the, the Nazis and stuff. But he was revered, and he was lived in Berlin. Um, and uh, they still have uh, in Germany the Max Planck Institute. Matter of fact, they have several Max Planck Institutes uh, that they've named after him for different physical sciences. Uh, frequency is in hertz, of course. Um, now, following that, in about 1905, Planck, or excuse me, Einstein and Bohr said, "All right, let's let's apply that to photons." Okay, equals HF for photons too. You know, so Planck was thinking about these little molecules jittering, doing the jitterbug inside of an incandescent glowing object. And Einstein said, all right, let's talk, talk about the hydrogen spectrum. You know, a glass tube filled with a little bit of hydrogen and zap it with high voltage. So it might not be hot, but it's still producing light, but only specific wavelengths. And Einstein said, you know what, dude, this works for, you know, A equals HF works for photons because it makes sense from what we know about the size of the electron. And then de Broglie used Planck's constant uh, for uh, the wave theory of electrons. So, um, and, and what we're going to find out is that uh, de Broglie's um, theory applies to every object in the universe. So here's the question. If, it, if an electron is a particle like J, what J.J. Thompson figured out, and what Rutherford figured out, you know, okay, the alpha particle is a particle, and the nucleus is kind of a particle, it's, and we now know it's com composed of a set of particles usually. But the hydrogen atom is just a single particle, the nucleus is. Um, if those things are particle, how can it be a wave? What? You know, will an electron diffract? Particles can't do that. All right, so, so what this is like, I, I want you to jot down that this wave particle, hey, can you, time out. Uh, Darian, it got sick. Oh, did she, did you get that? Uh, no, but uh, Malik, she got, she emailed Malik. Oh. She, she, I didn't get it. But could you, could you dash over to the desk where we can do the printouts? And just bring him back here quick as a bunny? Sure. Okay, thanks. All right, so maybe we will get those printouts. Um, okay, so particles. So people are asking themselves, uh, Dr. B., or no, they weren't asking me. Well, they were asking Dr. Uh, de Broglie. Um, what kind of a wave is this? It's a matter wave. <laughs> is it going to diffract? Is that really true? If it's true, it should display some diffraction. Okay? So, so J.J. Thompson says, forget it, de Broglie. Uh, it's a particle. And de Broglie is saying, Think of it as a wave. I'm just saying. He's, you know, because he was, you know, J.J. Thompson was, you know, he's illustrious and everything. And de Broglie was just a junior, you know, a junior G-man type. He, he was just a young sprout. But he came up with this hypothesis and said, I'm just thinking, just my opinion, treat an electron as a wave. And so people say to themselves, how can a, how can a particle also be a wave? Go ahead and write that sentence down. That's a question. How can a particle also be a wave? I mean, Sir Isaac Newton would never have sat for that. But de Broglie said, if you do think of it that way, it explains the hydrogen atom. And how can a particle also be a wave? It's like saying this. Uh... A particle that is also a wave is like is, is the same or is similar to saying, well, I have a bookcase that is also a horse. 
The bookcase that is also a horse makes about as much common sense to us as to Sir Isaac Newton saying a particle can also be a wave. But by God, they found it. In 1927, ding! Davison and Germer, two Americans, they were looking at, they were zapping a, a nickel crystal with electrons, with an electron gun, just like J.J. Thompson. And so they said, all right, J.J., let's zap this crystal, you know. All right, Sir Isaac, Professor Galileo, you're the boss. Let's zap this nickel crystal with some electrons and see what comes out the other side. That's what we do all the time. We try to... You know, scientists, we always think we're, you know, smart, ultra smart eggheads and all that stuff like that. But really, if you get in the lab, it's really creative fooling around with stuff and then recording your results so that somebody else can try it too. That's the whole thing. You know, let's, let's jam some electrons into this nickel crystal, see what happens. That's basically what they're doing. Brandon. So basically for scientists, lab is like recess? Kind of, yeah. It's like recess. It's like recess where you take notes. And then you tell your buddies, yeah, this is cool. You know, try this. You know? So, yeah, it's, I, it, granted, I, it, that, that's, that, that's the way it is. It's kind of cool. I mean, if you think of it that way. Anyway, so these guys um, uh, found diffraction patterns. Now, this is a, an alum, this is a modern day picture uh, with aluminum crystals. But this is electron diffraction. Okay, so you shine a beam in. And so now the, the, the openings uh, of the crystal are the spacings of the crystal lattice. Okay, so we don't have like, you know, the little student diffraction gradients that you guys held up. They're just parallel lines that block the light and parallel openings that emitted the light to pass through and diffract. Uh, this one is a little bit stranger, but you can see, you know, certain areas um, you get maximum, the bright areas here, this ring, this ring, this ring, and then this ring, and then here's your central image. This is what the beam would look like, this big bright spot in the middle. That's what your beam would look like if, it, if there wasn't anything there. Okay, so that's your central image. That's like your naked eye image. And then these other rings out here are where um, that specific uh, wavelength would diffract. Now, when we were looking at hydrogen, um, you may recall that you saw uh, two sets on the left and two sets on the right. Raise your hand if you remember seeing two sets of uh, red and blue and stuff to the left or to the right. Anybody remember that? Yeah, I see a few. Um, this is the second. This, this one here, this is the second line, the second ring. Whoops. This is the second ring. Um, and so that'd be like the second red line out. And then here, you know, if you had a really good diffraction gradient, you might see the third line, third red line, and then the fourth red line. And there's a bunch of other ones out here. So uh, this black and white photo, this is aluminum. It would look very similar for nickel crystal. Here's a picture of their um, original paper from the Physical Review, which is a big time, still still big time journal in the United States. Uh, notice the title of it, Diffraction of Electrons by a Crystal of Nickel by C. Davison and L. H. Germer. And then there's the abstract. The intensity of scattering of a homogeneous beam of electrons of adjustable speed. Adjustable speed. Adjustable speed. Make a note of that. Davison and Germer. They adjusted the speed of the electrons. In other words, they adjusted the momentum of the electrons. And here's what they found. The equivalent wavelength. See this in red that I've, I've boxed in red? That's the money. That's the pull quote. That's the money quote. Here it is. And you can jot this down or, or just listen. Equivalent wavelengths of the electron beams. What? Electrons have wavelengths? Yes, they may be calculated from the diffraction data in the usual way. So they said, all right, we're getting this diffraction pattern, and apparently it comes from electrons, not from light. But we're getting it, and it makes sense, because it says these turn out to be an acceptable agreement with the values of 
Da, 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 H over MV, de Broglie's hypothesis, lambda equals H over MV, there it is, of the undulatory mechanics. Now, undulatory is, is an old-timey word for waves, undulations, waves. So what we call it now is wave mechanics or quantum mechanics. But in those days, they call it, you know, this is... This is like within the first five years of the invention of quantum mechanics, they called it undulatory mechanics. Equivalent wavelengths of the electron beams may be calculated from the diffraction data in the lab in the usual way. These turn out to be in acceptable agreement with de Broglie's hypothesis and the values of H over MV of the undulatory mechanics. Now, Electron diffraction patterns can reveal a lot. Okay, so this, if you look at a crystal, different angles on a crystal, like this crystal, here's the mock-up or the, uh, what would you call it? The uh, schematic diagram of the crystal in different orientations, same crystal, and different orientations, and the diffraction patterns, uh, when you, see, you beam some electrons through there, they look different. You can see it. The bright spots are slightly different. So you can tell a lot about the angle, the orientation of a single crystal or uh, other stuff. Now, similar techniques apply to uh, DNA. So don't forget that. So electron diffraction patterns. Yeah. Um, de Broglie was verified. Same as Newton was verified when Halley's Comet returned. And Halley's Comet returned, that put a big check mark next to the law of universal gravitation. What these guys found, Davison and Germer, put a gigantic check mark next to um, de Broglie's hypothesis, lambda equals h over mv. So let's review. Okay, spectrum of hydrogen. Constant of nature, H. And then delta EPE, that's what selects the size of the orbit in accordance with the Broglie's hypothesis. Okay, delta EPE comes from the Coulomb interaction. K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. All right, and R is the distance from the nucleus to the electron in question. And then the orbital size controls the photon wavelength because only certain size orbits will correspond to an electron constructively interfering. And then once you get the wavelength, frequency, and then the energy. All right, so this is how it's all put together. And this is a close-up on part of the uh, hydrogen. The red line here on the right uh, is H alpha. And then this one over here, this kind of bluish uh, aqua line, is uh, H beta. Now, uh, last time, I'll, I'll just remind you of something we have been talking about, actually, for a couple, three weeks. And that is the idea of phase space. Phase space is the abstract space in which it's possible to map out the position and the momentum of a given physical system, like a mass on a spring. Mass on a spring, you have an oval shape for a regular old oscillator. Now it turns out that the phase diagram for the electron I just moved my, I moved my computer an inch. Unbelievable. Let me see if I can switch here. There we go. Gosh. Oh, 
oh Lord, I don't know, this, this computer up here. Anyways, it turns out that the phase diagram tells the exact tail changing from different energy levels corresponds to changing from a bigger ellipse to a smaller ellipse. And so here are three ellipses. Uh, the innermost ground state ellipse is shaded in. And then the second ellipse, the first excited state ellipse, uh, is not shaded in. And then the third ellipse, the n equals 3 second excited state, up from the ground state, is shaded in. And here's how the area tells the tale. The electron orbitals, the dynamical state from ellipse to ellipse is only allowed to change in multiples of Planck's constant. So the difference between the big area, so for n equals 3 down to n equals 2, that would be like going from this outer ellipse to the second ellipse. All right. The way nature works, we've now figured out, is that the change in the area, the difference in the area between the two ellipses, is in multiples of Planck's constant h. And this seems to be uh, the way, this is the granularity of nature. Those changes in the dynamical state are only allowed when the area changes in units uh, of Planck's constant. So the momentum is uh, mapped out on the vertical scale, and the position is mapped out on the horizontal scale. And what's that green thing? What the? I have no idea what that is. All right. Now, um, let's just go over your homework situation for tonight, and we're going to we're going to dismiss, but if you want to get your printout, you can get it. Stay, stay a few minutes till Caroline gets back, and we'll hand them out. Your homework for tonight is to do some reading up to page 36, and then take an eyeball of figure 9.10. Read ahead into chapter 10 if you like, um, and stick around if you want your printout.